My name is Vahid Chitsos, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning, this afternoon for you. Go ahead and let us know, um, introduce yourself and let us know where you're tuning in from. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having the time to do this. I know you've been working on stuff all day long. I've been catching you. Uh, most, awesome. of the, most of the news, you're just boom, banging them all out. Uh, my name is Eric Oliva, coming from Staten Island, New York. We are uh, Staten Island, the forgotten borough of New York. <laughs> Um, I work on uh, meditation and personal development coaching, and I've been working on that since 1988. Um, so this is when I was eight years old, <laughs> and then working on making this something I do since 1991. I was 11 years old, so I've been doing this for a very, very, very long time in terms of personal development for myself, and then trying to find better ways to allow people to find their their way through my methods. All right, just make awesome. up a new so method. Let's dive into it. I, I mean, we throw the, the, the terminology out there these days as if personal development should be something that everybody should know. What is your definition as a coach and someone who's got a lot of vast amount of experience? What the heck does personal development mean? This is so good. Personal development has taken such a beating with so many different you know, commercialize um, niches and hooks to get people to figure out, oh, maybe I should go find my newer self or my newer person, personage in, in this person's method. Actually, personal development is basically this. You have an idea of what you want to accomplish or be, and you just start working on that. Be it today, you don't want to smoke cigarettes anymore. That stopping is personal development. You're developing yourself from getting away from that bad habit. Or you want to develop yourself to have bad habits. <laughs> it can go both ways. So personal development is strictly and basically that which you want to make yourself become, for good so, or bad. Okay, but okay. So here's my question: If we just take U.S. about 330 million population, right? Why is not everybody doing it? If this was good, and out of this change could come out your new life or new self. Why is not everybody, why do we have to tell people to go do personal, why don't, why is it our education system, why is our effing education system doesn't have this implemented, 10th grade man, by 10th grade you should be able to read and write and comprehend most of the concepts. Why yep. we're not hanging out thinking Gorich in 10th grade? Why this was not part of my curriculum, why this was not given to me? Because this is great. if it was given to me, my life would have been completely, it I would be this, much better. I would say the same thing. If it was given to me, if I was out of the scarcity mindset as a kid growing up, I would not be where I have to figure out new ways of marketing, new ways of language, new ways of bringing stuff over um, into the public to try to get them to do stuff with me. I, I would already know how to do that because I wouldn't have doubted myself. I wouldn't have lived in scarcity. I wouldn't have gone the routes where I felt I had to struggle to make something. So, yes, our educational system is a whole lot of crap. Excuse my language if we're allowed to curse on here or something like that. But <clears throat> when I grew up, you had to design yourself into a, a mold in the schools I was in. And if you didn't fit that mold, you were kind of outcast. You were the black sheep. I went to an old Catholic school when I was a kid. My father said the Catholic school, you know, you, it's just safer there for you. During the 80s, uh, uh, in, in public schools, he didn't trust it. So he's like, just go to Catholic school. I don't care what you want to believe in. Okay, great. So I went there, but it was, I was into meditation. I was into practices of cultivating the mind. I was into tarot card reading, crystals and stuff. I was like eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, all into my 13 years old, into um, eighth grade. Teachers were like, he's into the occult. He's a strange kid. He's a weird kid. The nuns were all, Eric, you're a very special person. You're very strange, you know? Ooh, what's that symbol you have there? Let me tell you some history about that. So I'll go into evil eye and the tarot cards being the devil and all this nonsense. And it was hilarious for me, but it didn't make me waver. It just made me question, wait a second. What the hell's going on here? If I'm trying to find ways and I find ways that make me feel great and better about myself, why am I being you know, discriminated on? Like, what the hell? So it made me go further and deeper. And it made me question, why don't schools teach it? Maybe the traditional education system is really there to make kids or people become workers, not actually become open-minded, creative individuals. Those who do are, unfortunately, they are the exception. They are the people who said, F all this, let me go my way, and I'll, that's it. So personal development, now when we get to the word personal development, it's such a catchphrase, it's almost nauseating. I don't like saying personal development, but people won't recognize it when I say cultivating the mind. The hell is cultivating the mind? 
They don't know that. So I have to use the words that people know. Because when I was growing up, there was no life coach when I was 11 years old, 8 years old. Okay? There was strictly just a guru or the words guru because you had people from the 60s and 70s with the word guru and all that. Right? And then you had um, people, you know, psychologists trying to be your therapist, trying to train you. Then you had uh, people with hypnosis and coming out. So there wasn't really a catchphrase until Tony Robbins somewhere in the 90s turned around and said, I, I coach people in life. I'm life coach. Right? And I was like, oh, my God. I've been trying to figure this out. I was 11 years old. I think I heard it somewhere in the 90s. And I'm like, eh, I should use that word. No, nah, I don't want to use that word. But unfortunately, when you mention personal development, someone says that word. It's like, oh, God, here we go. Another guy with a self-help book. No, I don't have a self-help book. I hate that word, personal development. I think people should stop using it and say, hey, I have an idea. Maybe it works for you. Maybe it doesn't. Or maybe we can make a new one that can work for you. But, you know, when I see people say you're a coach, I say I'm a teacher. I teach how to meditate. I teach how to cultivate your mind. I teach martial arts. Um, I don't teach you how to live your life. I question the shit out of you. <laughs> why are you doing that, man? <laughs> What's the point of that? Why, why, why? Until I can find a why. You can't find a why. And it's like, okay, let me just not do that anymore because I'm just kind of silly at this point. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I totally get it because you got to think about it. The, the, the mindset that, you know, the, the culture that I grew up in is if you had to go get a coach or if you had to go get a mentor or if you went to a psychologist or you went to a doctor and you went to uh, MFT, marriage, family, th th these type of therapists, like it wasn't, you weren't labeled as someone is trying to better themselves. You were labeled the opposite. Oh, you have a problem. Oh, now we know why you're like that. Oh, okay. Now you came out and you said you're, you're, you're out loud saying you have a problem. They didn't look at that as a good thing. They looked at it as a bad thing. So a lot of people, they're like, oh, I don't want to be like that. So let me keep it inside. Let me keep my challenges. And I mean, wouldn't it be easier to teach a 10-year-old how to have the right mindset? Versus someone who's 40 years old, who's gone through life. Now they got like 30 years worth of non-productive mindset. And then mm -hmm. now we got to pull that out. And re listen, it's always easier to start with a brand new computer because it doesn't have anything. It's empty. Versus you got a computer that's been running for 10 years. It's got so much viruses on it. You literally have to go and format it and then it start all over again. So oh. I think the younger we can get them to go and do the self-development, shift their mind, find out who they are, I think they'll have a, a, a better fighting chance. I agree. I was eight years old when I learned how to do self-introspective meditation. Like my sister was, my second sister, she's the one who taught me it. She was 14. She was into witchcraft and all that cool stuff. But she came across this technique of... Um, cultivating your attention, putting where you're putting your attention, learning how to develop focus. So in her mind, she wants to teach her older brother. What she didn't tell me until 11 years later, that she was gonna, trying to test to see if I was going to go crazy. <laughs> she was like, let me see if this will turn my brother into a psycho or whatever. It did it, um, <laughs> at least from my end. <laughs> um, she told me this method. We stayed for three hours practicing it, and I got hooked. There was no special, amazing you know, out of this world, fantasy, spiritual, spiritual thing to it. It was strictly, I felt stable. I felt good. And I didn't want to get out of that. So I practiced it daily. And she wasn't one to give me all that information. I just said, I feel like this. Oh, just keep practicing. Because she didn't know what to say. So her guidance was keep practicing, which was the best she could ever do. Because she didn't, in, she didn't put into, excuse me, put into my mind suggestions of what I should feel or think like. So she left my blank slate blank and let me figure it out. And if I had problems, she would definitely give me some help in those problems. You know? Well, I agree um, with that 100%. I, I totally was, agree with that 100%. So, it was easier for me to come out of it because I was eight years old with nothing in my head. <laughs> keyword right there, eight years old. So here's my question. Let's say somebody wants to improve their lifestyle and improve who they are, whatever that might be for somebody. For somebody, it would be health-wise. Some people, it's monetary. Whatever the case might be. Where do you think they need to start to be able to have that growth? Okay. I'm glad you asked that question. Do you want to know why? Because I found so many people who are asked that question, 
give a whole bunch of these metaphors and analogies and roundabout answers, and I call them cop-out answers. The fact is, look at what you're doing now. I've experienced it this way. If I want to know who I am, what am I doing? What am I doing will dictate exactly what I'm being and what I will become. So if I am wanting to lose weight, what am I doing? I'm not doing anything that equates losing weight. I have to do that thing. And if I sit there confused on what I have to do, what do I have to eat, then don't even bother with all the confusing thoughts. Take the first step. Exercise something. Just go and go for a walk. Go for a run. Do the baby steps because you won't overwhelm your brain. You won't overwhelm your mind and all your um, habit thinking and, and negative narratives that say, oh, I can't accomplish it. I can't do this. It's too much. It's too much work. My legs hurt. My knees hurt. All the excuses come on. You can rationalize yourself out of anything, but you cannot convince yourself to get into anything. It has to be a realization. And realization isn't this go on the mountaintop and realize this amazing self. It's strictly just look at what the hell you're doing. You got to demystify all of this because the mystification, if that's even a word, <laughs> the making something so mystical and mysterious is a sales technique. Make someone feel like it's so far apart from them, but they need it because it's so amazing for them. Like I've seen this since I was eight years old in all these makeshift gurus all through the 80s into the 90s and 2000, even in China, when I lived in China. Same concept, sell the idea that it's mysterious, you can only get it from exclusive people, and you have to take that advice or you're out, you can't get it. But the fact is when people want to change, you have to look at where they are. What do they want to accomplish? Don't look at how many things they have to do. What the hell are you not doing? And just use one of those things. You can make a list of five things of what you're not doing, and just take one, take the easiest one. Give yourself a break at that point because you went a the person really went further enough to say I ain't doing anything. So go take the easiest one and make that step and work around that to get your start. It could take a week to get into the mode, it could take two weeks. When I was in my twenties, it sometimes took me three months to get into a practice that I knew would make me stronger physically and better mentally. And it took me three months to really enjoy doing it. I hated it because it was a lot of intense physical work. <laughs> no, I mean listen, it's a lot of action. It's not love sitting on your ass on your couch. It's just the way it's it is. Rich. So. In that aspect, you can't sit there and go, I'm going to be rich one day. Oh, I can imagine a Ferrari and a million dollars. No, it, you know, the affirmations are garbage. And I love Mel Robbins. She says the affirmations are garbage. And I've, been, I've just been thinking that for such a long time because it's true. You can't think yourself rich. You can't think yourself great. But what you can do is start with the idea that this is what you want to become. Start doing things that equate it. So you're thinking actually has tangibility. You can track it. If you can't track it, it's garbage. No, I agree with that. <laughs> I mean, even with meditation, even with health, even with weight loss, even with school, everything, if it's not, you're not tracking it, you're not going to get there. You just got to see. I mean, you want to know where you're at. <laughs> I mean, yeah, everybody too. that wants to lose weight, they're starting from somewhere. Like, you got to document how many pounds do I wear today versus tomorrow or, or a month out. Or that could be a monetary, you know? What grade are you in? Where do you want to go? What level of math are you in? So all of these different things, tracking it. But I think, like, it's that self-awareness, us being, I don't want to say honest, but being true to ourselves, cutting the BS out, not for other people, just for yourself. Like, you could lie, cheat, bullshit, do whatever you want to do to others, but at some point, you can't do that to yourself. Like, you got to start saying, this is what I'm doing. Like, you don't have to go outside and do a whole entire Instagram live and confess that this is what you're doing. A lot of people look at that as vulnerability. I look at it as that as BS. Like, why do you need to let other people know? Do you know? As long as you know and you're correcting it, people are going to know the outcome and the results. You don't need to go kind of, you know, I don't yeah, know. Don't you don't feel, it. You can take it off it. of you. If you're not passionate, if you're not feeling it for yourself, if you're not excited, not like, oh, yay, I'm excited, but if you're just not feeling up and ready to go to do something, people can feel that. They can know it's going to be BS. They're going to tell. They're going to feel it. If I talk to you and I go, yeah, well, you know, if people don't feel it, it's not going to be really that strong. Like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I don't want to listen to him. I feel strongly about this because I grew up in a practice where I had to – be honest to myself or I'm just going to experience a whole lot of shit for it. And I practice meditation. Practice getting into meditation. Maybe more 
on that. So cultivating the mind in person, basically personal development, uh, cultivating the mind and then getting into meditation, not getting into like a fad, actually a lifestyle, like a thing I do. And then I see 30 years down the line, it's just everything is bastardized in this practice and it's driving me mad because the point of meditation isn't I'm going to feel distressed and feel no more anxiety and feel blissful and happy. No, the point is to realize what's true, not be confused. It's full out method is no more confusion. That, like its whole point is, is no more confusion. And that confusion so doesn't I come from... Question, I have a question on that. And I've, and I've asked a few coaches and, and mentors and influences regarding this. So when you meditate, I feel like there's two different kinds, or I've created this for myself, or there's two types. One type, there is nothing, is blank. You try to get rid of all the thoughts, so there is nothingness. And when I do that, I have the best sleeps ever, man. I knock out like there's no tomorrow. That's like a meditation for, that's like a medication for me instead of meditation. So I'm knocked out. I'm not like, this is the best thing ever. I knock myself out because there's nothing to think about. I get the best naps. Then there's the other type of, type of meditation where there are thoughts, but I'm decluttering it and I'm focusing on one idea and trying to play with that and see what I can do and how I can expand on that C instead of not having it anything. So which one should I be doing more or what, what is your idea that, what do you think I'm experiencing, which is weird? Okay, okay. So I wanna clear up what the word meditation means. So everyone where we've seen marketed and talked about and every guru and every coach and everyone's talking about meditation, is de-stressing and actually meditation does nothing, absolutely nothing for you. Meditation is a state where there is nothing happening. Your senses, all six senses, which includes the mind, are not stimulated. They are not obstructed by a stimuli, simulation. There is no thinking. There is no time con uh, discrimination. There's no earth, um, sky above and earth below. There's no I. There's no, oh, my God, I'm meditating. This is amazing. There's none of that. There's nothing. It's gone. Nothing. But there's no observation of nothing, so that nothingness doesn't exist either. An unbiased, and we call it a thusness, neither here nor there. There is a known duality. So in that state, you cannot do anything. There is no you that is doing anything. Before you get into meditation, you have methods of cultivating the mind, which are cultivating pra cultivation practices, which are, indeed, how do I put my attention in one place, how do I build my focus so my senses or my stimulation doesn't come in and, and affect my mind, right? Um, put my breath or my attention to my abdomen so I can work on abdominal breathing, right? So in that, you start to calm down. Why? Because you're stimulating your vagus nervous system. You're stimulating your neurochemical responses in the body to calm you down. And if you're calming down, those neurochemicals are doing all their wonderful things. You're going to experience states of bliss of relaxation it's like you're stoned but you're not doing drugs and that's the pre-meditating um so it could be visualization mantra it could be recitation um it could be standing and posture holding practices it could be walking lying sitting and um standing four aspects of actually cultivating the mind into meditation so what you are doing those two things you were saying before actually those are practices that lead you to meditation when you don't know whether you're breathing and there is no idea that there is a you has to distinguish things, that is meditation. But you won't know that until so, you're out of it. So, okay, so here's my question for you. If I'm focusing, let's say I'm doing breath work. So if I'm focusing on my breathing, am I not using my senses to focus on my breathing? Using your thinking, you're using your, your nose, you're using your five senses and your sixth sense, which is your mind. You're using your six senses, but what happens is if a mosquito lands on you, you're going to brush it off. You're not focused enough because you shouldn't really be able to tell whether a mosquito is there or not. You see, when the six senses are actually focused, meaning they're not departing from their main one single-minded you know, focus, focal point, when they are all focused, they're not separating. When they are trying to get focused, something takes your attention that means they weren't locked down enough. They're not settled in. The senses have not been brought in. We say illuminating within. That means bringing your senses inward, your attention inward. Eventually, your senses follow. 
So when you're doing breath work, you're doing um, one probably visualizing your breath going in through your nose, down through your abdomen. You are becoming, um, uh, I hate this word, but I'll use it, mindful of breath going through your nose, down and how that feels, the strength that's your diaphragm and how well you're expanding and contracting your abdomen. You're using your senses to actually utilize focus to one specific point, which is excellent. You are which, is, which is guided meditation, but you're listening to somebody. So I was like, how could you be, you know, I'm just trying to imagine, like, how would you get into that state? Because if no, if when listening... someone's, see, when someone's guiding you, they're suggesting to you how and where you should put your attention. That doesn't build up actual strength in the ability to attain meditative state. That just gives you a guiding hand to bring you to a place where you feel relaxed, where you feel bliss, where you feel happiness, where you feel good, you know? Um, other than that, I'm trying to fix my camera here so I can stay in frame and not get everyone else on the sides. Um, other than that, guided, med guided meditation isn't really guided meditation. It's actually guided hypnosis. It's actually hypnosis. It's helping you learn or utilize your visualization practice, your breathing practice, your recitation practice, your posture practice. It's not meditating because I can't guide someone into meditation. That would be a misnomer. I cannot take someone across that ocean for them. They have to toil. They have to stress. They have to go through anxiety and stress of their imagination, of their narratives, all their memories, all their associations, and the things they feel they cannot let go in emotion and thought about themselves and the people around them, the self-view and the view of the world. They have to go through ripping that apart finding the origin of it, that builds up concentration strength. You build up the strength so much. We say in, in, um, in practice called samadhi, it's this deep concentration strength. When you're unmoved, you've done so well at your skill of focus that you're not moved. Boom, you automatically enter, and I'm putting it in quotes, meditative state. So all the prerequisite, which is all the breath work and the guiding practices, is just someone guiding you to get into building strength. That person has to continue on their own or they will never attain that real unbiased state of meditation. You'll so feel like... Question. So here's my okay. question. So based on what you just explained, there should be a state that you're in, that there's no observation, but you're in it. The exterior noise, the, 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 your, your, so everything is focused. So if there is, for example, someone's slammed the door, Someone comes in, someone throws something at you, or whatever, temperature decreases or increases. You should not feel that, not because you're not there, it's because your focus and attention is to something else on purpose. Because your senses, yes, your senses do not have the substance of, that gives it attention anymore. So all that attention, our mind, the substance that feeds our mind, that energy, bioenergy, whatever we want to call it, you know, spirit, all that, whatever, all of that attention goes somewhere else. That's not coming out anymore. So if you're, let's put it this way. If you're in a practice that's leading you into meditation, if you're sitting there and you're focusing your breath and doing all the cool stuff that gets you into deep concentration, and someone says your name and you turn your head, your hearing is already still, it's still obstructed. Your hearing was not focused. Your hearing sense did not go inward. It's still grasping. If you close your eyes slightly, or if you close your eyes all the way and you're doing your meditation practice, you see images and you follow so, them. So here's my question. Let's say you rest. suck at this thing, and you, you are all over the place and everything else. If you practice that, let's say, 15, 20 minutes per day, how many years or how much time would you say it should typically take before you attain that state, given that you are working on it on a daily basis? Because awesome. this is what I feel like. Someone is going to do this for like 30 days. Shit don't work out. Someone is still calling your name. Your phone goes off. You still, you're like, see, I told you that Vahid was bullshitting, man. This shit doesn't work. I did it for 30 days. I still yeah. hear my phone. I did it for five years before I hit major breakthroughs in my own specific uh, neurological mental abilities. Um, Cognitive ability started to be, I was 13. I started to feel like Superman almost. Like meaning I was learning things faster. I was able to comprehend things faster. I was able to do things faster. I felt really good. And I didn't do drugs and I didn't do amazing, you know, like supplements like that to feel that way. However, if someone's going to do this for 30 days and expect something, I'm not giving a cop-out answer. You have to understand what 
the quality of your practice is daily, is going to give you that result. Someone can fall into this state in two days. They can fall into the state in five minutes. It really depends on how much real intent they are giving. Intention. Now, it doesn't mean I have to guide them or go, check, oh, you're not giving enough intention. You didn't get it. Ha, ha, ha. No, that's a cop out answers too. This is why a meditation or a cultivation practice cannot be tracked for ability. It cannot because each person has different capacity. Some people will take five years before they understand my sentence I just said. You can see that with Buddhist monks. Buddhist monks, they'll be there for 30 years and not attain any state of awakening. And then all of a sudden, someone drops a cup, breaks a cup, and they, oh, oh my God, I realized. Holy crap, I realized it. Like there's stories of that happening. It takes 30 years. Sometimes it takes five minutes. But we don't know because this idea of saying, attaining... I want, to talk to the guy, I want to talk to the guy who takes some five minutes. We need his ass on this live session. We need, we need to find out what he's doing in five minutes. We need, to find, we need to track these people. We need to get a hold of these people. We need to do <laughs> live session because I don't know if I got 30 years. <laughs> That's so funny. So, so the way a person is going to develop it, and I'll give everyone a method right now. And if you work on this, it's really dependent on what's in your mind, how you feel, what conditions are around you, what are those issues in your head? Because the point is not to shut out the world. You cannot shut out the world um, because you practice meditation or try to get into meditation, you shut out the world. And you cannot do that. If you are not still, you know, everyone talks about stillness and being still. If a person does not cultivate their mind, they're not reaching state of meditation. Therefore, if they are not still, if they are movable in their attention, they're not getting into meditation. So you're not practicing or getting meditation to become still and find your stillness. That's garbage. It's not going to happen. You are still prior. And then all of a sudden that builds up so much like in, um, intense concentration that you reach meditation and boom, like all that's gone. You don't even know you're breathing. There is no observating. There's observating. There is no observation. There's no observer. There is none of this, right? It's just strictly in the state where – here. You can mark it by the place between your inhale and exhale. Nothing happens there. It's like that. Okay, but here's a method. It's, it's a three-step method. It's really simple. It's not my method. I didn't make this shit up. This is a real Chan practice, Zen Buddhist practice, okay? And it's all method. So whenever anyone hears me ever in the future talking about Buddhism or Taoism, it's strictly method and application, not dogma, not religion. Just not dogma. I don't, I don't do that. Um, I learned it. And obviously, I don't do it, and there's a reason. So anyway, the eyes, they gaze lightly down towards the direction of your nose. You don't close your eyes all the way. You keep your eyes slightly open. No squint either, because that sucks. You just let your, let your eyes rest lightly. They're going to gaze down at the nose. So we say the eyes contemplate the nose. Then as your attention is reaching, you know, full, you feel, feel your nose. You feel you're in your nose, favorably. You, you bring your attention, your nose contemplates the mouth or the tongue. The nose contemplates the tongue. And that space, the same method, you're concentrating eyes to nose, nose to tongue. Then when that feels full, you know, your tongue contemplates the heart, the physical heart, the actual heart, not some chakra. I'm not talking about things that you cannot tangibly track yet because you can get into that conversation maybe another time. But right. your eyes contemplate the nose, nose contemplates the tongue, tongue contemplates the heart. Over time, that single-minded concentration builds up intensely. You will reach and cut through all the chatter, all the crap in the mind, emotions, visions, memories, all these things. And you will reach states of silence, quietness, and start working on getting into that meditation. Once you hit meditation, based on the quality of your, of your practice that led you there to build up concentration, the work really begins. Because you have to stay in there. You stay in there longer. It could be five minutes. You can do 30 minutes of meditation, only have two minutes of quality practice. That's why I can't tell someone 30 days you're going to be great with this. No, I'm not selling people that bullshit. I'm telling you, here's the practice. You practice it every day, you will benefit. What the benefits are is really based on what you're doing for yourself and tracking your emotion, tracking your habits, tracking your, th tracking your thinking habits, Okay. You have to track them. You wake up in the morning, if you feel like crap, and you're telling yourself, oh, another day, I can't believe this is sucks, you know, and you're moping around, you're setting yourself up. And I know it sounds so cliche, but it's, you're just setting yourself up for the day when you wake up. When I wake up, I'm like, all right, good, I'm getting up. I don't think, oh, it's my day. Sometimes I go, yeah, fuck, this is my day. Excuse my language. This is my day. I'm really going to go out and take this day. What does that mean? It means I'm going to do things that make me 
feel valuable to me. Take that cup of coffee and enjoy the hell out of that coffee. Stretch my legs out and stretch really great and feel good about it. Chase my cat. Get the water gun. Spray my cat a little. Make your life miserable for five minutes. Just, you know, things that just bring quality and happiness to you. Like, that's how you make your day better. And it's so only beats. Here's, here's, here's my question. Here's my question. Let's talk about the benefits of it. Obviously, for some people, it brings in quality. Some people are stressed. Maybe they get distressed. I don't know. Whatever that, that case might be. But generally speaking, what qualities or what part of my life or which aspect of my life would I see improvements on so this way I am motivated to build that habit of spending that time every day? Because if I don't know the end point, it will be very difficult for people to spend that time. You got to give, at the end of the day, we program. You know, this is, if you do this certain amount of things, certain amount of hours, you're going to get this. If you do this much of dieting, you, you're you expected to lose this much weight. So we got to have that end result in mind to strive to get there. Now, obviously, when we get there, we're like, okay, we're not going to stop here. We're going to continue. But what are some of those qualities that we could uh, be excited about? Be excited about having control. People always you know, bitch about control being some negative, aggressive thing. Oh, we can't control our thinking. We can't control our mind. That's a total crock of shit. Excuse my language. I'm just so passionate about this. I just can't grasp how people would actually give and submit to the idea that they cannot control how they're supposed to feel, right? If anything is going to be of benefit in any type of cultivation practice for the mind, be it for stress relief, anxiety, it's not meditation because meditation don't give you that. It's pre-practice that actually gives you that. Um, if there's any benefit that people will actually see, control. They will have maybe a five second, maybe a point se point five seconds of, I don't want to do that. When they would have just automatically went in and did the thing. Maybe they were going to go reach for that cigarette and all of a sudden they second guess themselves or have that drink or maybe they were going to have that steak and they're like, well, maybe I should cut it in half because that would make me feel better instead of feeling bloated and heavy. Like, but those instances, you will find yourself in control, pulling the strings. Instead of having your cyclic thinking pull the strings, your cyclic emotional habits pull the strings. Or, better yet, the news and everyone else in your home and all your friends and everyone who's telling you on social media or whatever media that you should believe and think a certain way and feel a certain way, and if you don't, you're a jerk. So... You have to have control. And the only way you're going to get control over your own thinking and your own expression, whatever the hell it is you want to be, is if you look at that inside. What am I doing to myself? What am I thinking? I don't want to think. So meditating, ultimately, the practice that leads to meditation, we'll call it cultivation practice, gives you the strength to recognize what it is you're doing that screws you up. Because it's going to be like a very clear movie. At first, it's vague. Oh, I'm just going through my day. Now it's like, wait, it's slowing down. I seen that happening yesterday, and it's happening again today. I don't want to do that. Oh, the pull is too strong. I'm falling into the cycle. And you jump back into it, and you go back and do it over again. And tomorrow, it's like Groundhog Day. We're living that over and over again, like that movie. You're waking up in the same habits. This is karma. This is when the Buddha was talking about cyclic existence and karma, that wheel of karma. Karma isn't some magical, mystical thing that some magical being is going to be picking and choosing who's going to get a punch in the face today and who's going to become an ant and who's going to get stepped on. It, it doesn't work that way. Karma is simply you doing something, your action. What you keep feeding is what you're always going to get. There's a saying, you know, I'm not going to try to do that because it's a very, you know, like a, uh, say it in Chinese, but I'm going to say it in English, um, tongue twister. Right? Where, where, you know, you keep getting what you keep getting. Whatever you keep doing, you're always going to keep getting. <laughs> you know? Well, so those, that's I mean, karma. I, I totally believe in that. I mean, it's, and, and there, sometimes there is a delay. Sometimes there is a delay. A lot of people think that I do good or bad, and I'm going to get it right now. But there is that delay, which is... It which has is to build up momentum. It builds up momentum. Your actions build up momentum. Why? Because we are electrical beings, bioenergy. Our energy, our body is electrical. We have neurological systems. We have electrical systems in our body, right? All of electricity. People like to call it aura, like to call it spirit. Cool, whatever. But let's make it tangible. Let's make it tangible. Our body radiates bioenergy. 
It's there. We know it. We can track that. We can really feel that. Okay, good. So whatever we are acting like, we're going to attract. It just happens. But it doesn't mean you're going to act like you have a million dollars and you're going to attract a million dollars. No, you probably don't have the ability to actually utilize the opportunities that bring you a million dollars. Just don't have the skill. That's it. So you're not going to get those opportunities. The, 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 the vehicle has to be ready. It has to be strong. You can't run a mile if you're 500 pounds overweight. You're not going to do it. Probably won't get three steps without hurting your knees. You have to cultivate. So you have to get the skills built, and you have to have the capacity, the ability to actually do the thing. Right? So this is why it takes time for certain things to occur because it, takes, it needs momentum. So if I can take a brick and I slam it through a window, I'm going to get millions of shards of glass, be they small or big, right? But they're probably going to be small because I hit it so hard and everything comes crashing down really, really fast because of that. But if I take that same brick and I just toss it lightly at the window, toss it lightly, I'm going to get really big chunks of glass. That's karma. As much as you give, that's what you're getting. So good or bad, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you are utilizing, how you are utilizing it, and what are you gaining? What are you gaining? What are you getting? So if anyone's going to get a benefit from practicing cultivating the mind to get into meditation and realize their inherent wisdom, which is basically an unbiased, non-discriminating thusness that is within, inherent in all things, if you're going to get to that beautiful state, right? The only benefit you're going to get from getting there is actual, like, trackable control of your own thinking. If you're wanting to get that great, wonderful, beautiful feeling of bliss and happiness, don't do it. Go, go buy a course on Udemy and, and be like, I want to I be beautiful meditation happiness today and, and golden unicorns. That's fine. But if you want the real work, you have to toil, you have to sweat, you have to hate yourself. You're going to go through stages of hating yourself, stages of loving yourself, ups and downs, bipolar galore, and all of a sudden it's going to break through. Why? Because you have guidance. Guidance not in your practice of meditation, because you can't do guidance in meditation, but practice in where you put your attention. Do you have guidance in where you put your attention? That's why you, someone gets a, a teacher. Uh, so someone calls me and says, hey, I want to learn some meditation. I'm like, all right, how long should I study with you for? I don't know. I don't know. Do you want to do this? Don't want to waste my time? Do you want to waste your time? Let's do three classes, four classes for a month, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. And then after that, you decide, because I need some time to really track with you what you're doing. If you were here with me, it'd be easier, because I could see you like three days a week and, you know, get you going faster. But the fact is, it's, a, it's guiding where the attention goes. If a person's doing their practice, and they're like, oh, my back hurts. And I remembered something my ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend said five years ago, and it really pissed me off. And then I started crying, and... And most people go, that's okay, that's emotional release. I'm like, no, jerk, get your attention where you got to go. Stop your practice right away, just stop, and start over again. Stop for a moment, go get some water, wash your face off, and go back and build the strength up again. Because the moment you start going into the state of emotion, you start building up more narrative, and you're adding head on top of head on top of head, and it's more stuff you got to rip up. Meditation, practice, cultivation of the way, cultivation of the mind is about stripping you out and finding what actually is your programming from your thinking program to your neurological program to how those things intertwine with your senses, finding the source of what the hell is making you do the, thing, do the things you do, like the things you like, say the way you say it, your whole characteristic, your whole preferences, everything is in there. And we call it the mind ground in cultivation practice, in Buddhist cultivation. It's called the eighth consciousness. And I will give you a tangible way to find it. It is your neurological system. Your neurotransmitters, your neurological system, your brain. Go pass into the subconscious. Go out of that. Nothing like that. It's strictly your body and mind combined together, making this whole entire crap that we call whatever it is our existence is, whether we like it or not, from conception to birth to old age and death. Love it. How do people find you? <laughs> Um, well, if they're on Instagram, you can get me at The Awakened Journal, um, and you can DM me there. You can find me at Eric, E-R-I-K, at Awaken24, numbers24.com, um, Facebook, Awaken24 Community Group, and um, that's how you can get me. 
Listen, I want to thank you so much for taking this time and being with us and and sharing the the, the wisdom. Uh, I definitely picked a few things that I'm going to go implement right away, and I'm going to let you know. I'll give you some feedback on what's going on, what's happening. I definitely will let you know if I start crying. I will let you know. <laughs> get that I get that. Stop crying! Stop crying! <laughs> <laughs> but if I really? if I stop crying if I start crying I'm gonna go wash my face and I'm gonna go do it again. <laughs> I'm telling you, it, man. Uh, man, listen, what's but to this, go into? This, this is just working on yourself. So it, you need to be working on yourself. You need to be paying attention to yourself. So this is something that everybody needs to do on their own. It's not something that it's got to be voluntary. You got to show up to do the work. So I do the work. You said how to be the land. Yep, That's and you can find some techniques on my uh, um, Instagram profile. I got a lot of methods in there and all that stuff, and I got a YouTube channel. But don't worry about all that stuff. Just yeah, just do the practice. It's in the it's in our talk just now. It's good. <laughs> it's no frills, no garbage. I'm not trying to sell you special, awesome, you know, seven day trial stuff. I'm just telling you straight up. That's the message. I love it. Thank you so much for being authentic. Hopefully, looking forward to doing more videos with you. I appreciate you taking awesome. the time. So much Stay awesome. safe, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be well. Bye -bye. Peace.